Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Welcome to my video on psychopharmacology and counseling. In this video, I'll be reviewing uh, psychopharmacology in general terms and relating it to our role as counselors. So what is psychopharmacology? It's the scientific study of the actions of drugs and their effects on mood, sensation, thinking, and behavior. Psychoactive drugs, which uh, we also call psychotropic uh, medication, psychoactive drugs have been used for thousands of years. They weren't referred to as psychoactive drugs uh, for thousands of years. There was many different uh, types of natural and herbal remedies uh, that have been used uh, for a variety of symptoms like I said, for thousands of years. But the industry, the psychopharmacological industry, has only been around since around the 1950s, which I'll cover in the next slide. And they produce medications that treat a wide variety of disorders, uh, of course, that counselors also treat, uh, like depression, bipolar disorders, anxiety disorders, post-traumatic stress disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, schizophrenia, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, cognitive disorders, sleep disorders, and substance use disorders. And this list isn't exhaustive. For example, uh, many prescribers use psychoactive drugs to treat personality disorders. Uh, even though in a lot of those instances, the medication is actually treating uh, another comorbid disorder, but that could help with the personality disorder. So as I mentioned, uh, modern psychopharmacology started in the 1950s. Uh, I guess you could say the industry started at that time. Um, and some of the early medications were antidepressants, antipsychotics, mood stabilizers. And largely, the effects of these psychoactive drugs uh, especially in the early years, were discovered by accident. So uh, an agent would be produced, it would be consumed for one purpose, and a benefit that was not intended would be realized, and then it would be uh, also used for um, the mental health symptoms that it appeared to have some positive effect on. And that went on for many, many years. It was kind of a trial and error system. And now the industry uses what's called rational drug design. So they have a uh, much better idea uh, of the biochemistry behind medications, and they purposefully design medications to treat certain symptoms. Now, that doesn't mean that some of the benefits aren't accidentally realized. That still happens. And older medications that were discovered by accident are being studied and uh, scientists are trying to figure out how uh, the medication works. A lot of the medications that are used uh, to treat mental health symptoms, even today, uh, the mechanisms of these medications are not known. Taking a look at the properties and mechanisms of psychoactive drugs, they're manufactured from natural sources, uh, like from plants and animals as well as through chemical synthesis. So um, chemicals are synthesized in laboratories. Uh, sometimes they're mixed with natural sources, sometimes they're not. The drugs interact with specific receptors, which leads to physiological and or psychological changes. Uh, we would hope, in most instances, positive changes, and of course, if they are negative, we refer to them uh, most of the time as side effects. So I want to make a distinction here between uh, drug action and drug effect. A drug action is the specific interaction between a drug and the receptors it affects. All right, and that, that can be, for some medications, very similar across large groups of uh, clients, um, but there's always going to be a little difference because each client is unique. 
and then you have the drug effect, which is the actual physiological and or psychological change, again, that we hope is positive. And, and again, some drugs seem to have pretty much the same effect for large groups of clients, but each client is unique. And uh, with depending on the symptoms, depending on the client and the drugs that are being used, uh, it's hard to predict for prescribers the drug effect will be. So again, sometimes just as in the manufacturing uh, of drugs uh, or, or the uh, realization of what drugs could be used for, there's a trial and error effect. Uh, there's also a trial and error uh, effect when trying to dial in the right medications at the right dose for a particular client uh, given that client's symptoms and symptom history. It is not unusual for a client to be with the prescriber for quite some time before that um, optimal psychoactive drug combination is prescribed to help that client. And then remember, over time, the client's going to change. They may become tolerant of the medication or new stressors might be introduced into their lives. So the prescriber will again have to make adjustments to try to dial in for uh, the maximum positive benefit while trying to minimize uh, any negative side effects. And really, if you think about it, that's not tremendously different from what we do as counselors. Uh, and certainly we are responsible practitioners uh, as a group. And we, when we treat a client, we want to use a therapy which will maximize the benefit to that client. And sometimes certain uh, therapies aren't effective with certain clients at certain times. And we have to modify uh, our treatment to maximize benefit. Prescribers have to do the same thing. So let's take a look at who prescribes psychoactive drugs. Well, the, the um, number one prescriber of psychoactive drugs, of course, would be psychiatrists. And remember, psychiatrists are physicians. It's a specialty, psychiatry. Uh, primary care physicians can also prescribe uh, psychoactive drugs, uh, but typically, uh, what we see from primary care physicians is they'll prescribe small doses of relatively safe psychoactive drugs. Now that's not always the case, but that's what we often see. And if they don't um, observe the desired change in the, in the client, then they'll refer that client to a psychiatrist. And really, that is the role of a primary care physician, is to take a look at a client, determine the needs, uh, in many cases try to directly treat the client, but if it's outside their uh, area of specialty, they'll refer the client to a neurologist, to a surgeon, to an optometrist, and sometimes to a psychiatrist. Also, nurse practitioners and physician assistants uh, can prescribe uh, under certain circumstances and uh, especially psychiatric nurses will uh, oftentimes prescribe psychoactive drugs. And in some states, uh, psychologists are permitted to prescribe certain psychoactive medications. So now that you have a general understanding of psychopharmacology, how does that relate to counseling? I think these four different roles I have here, advocate, monitor, educator, and collaborator, do a fairly good job of um, summing up our role as counselors when working with clients in an environment where psychoactive drugs are available, right? And of course, in uh, the United States and in, <coughs> in many countries, uh, that's the case the mental health treatment system has both counseling and psychopharmacological 
avenues available to clients. So the first role is the role of an advocate. And what this role entails is sometimes when, like say you're treating a client and they have symptoms that are beyond what you can treat effectively with just counseling alone. And they go to seek, you know, based on, on your advice or just because they want to, they seek out uh, psychoactive drugs. Like they go to a prescriber and they say, you know, look, my symptoms are uh, disturbing, uh, they are limiting functioning, and I think psychoactive drugs would be helpful. And what your role there is you're an advocate. You advocate for the client uh, to, um, with their permission, communicate with that prescriber and provide your uh, clinical opinion about what's going on with that client, any symptoms that you've observed uh, or that you have evidence, uh, otherwise have evidence to believe that they are there and to the degree to which those symptoms are uh, limiting the client's functioning. Now, at first glance, that might not seem like a very important role uh, for a counselor because, in theory, a client can go to a prescriber and uh, present a lot of this information uh, you know, for themselves. But in reality, uh, because the way our mental health system is designed, it's sometimes difficult for uh, clients to get a lot of time in front of a prescriber. You know, oftentimes that time is very limited and if they're not particularly effective at expressing what's going on with their mental health in a concise manner, uh, they'll run out of time before they can fully explain uh, what they want to explain to the prescriber. Uh, so, so part of being an advocate uh, could simply be to help the client to uh, parsimoniously uh, explain or even write down what is going on with them, what symptoms they have, and how these symptoms are disturbing them, and what they you know, they might want uh, or they think might help in terms of uh, medications. Now, what a client receives in terms of medications and what they want may be two different things, uh, but you want to uh, get the client in the mindset of expressing you know, what it is they want, what their goals are so that the prescriber has information uh, to use and then make an informed uh, clinical judgment about what that client should receive in terms of medication, if, if any. Uh, then we have the role of the monitor. And what this role involves is, uh, and this kind of goes along with collaborator, which I'll get to in a bit, uh, but oftentimes you'll be working uh, as a counselor, you'll be working in the field, and you'll be collaborating with prescribers. And of course you do this with the consent uh, of the client. And some agencies, uh, depending on uh, the setting, uh, psychiatrists uh, or other prescribers will be in the same agency. And when clients enter into that agency, uh, they will sign a consent as they come in, which acknowledges what's called continuity of care, uh, which means that you can communicate with case managers, uh, prescribers, other counselors if need be, uh, to further the care of your client. Uh, but either way, uh, it's not unusual that you'll be interacting with prescribers. And oftentimes, uh, prescribers will only see clients maybe once every two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, and sometimes even longer. There'll be, there'll be longer uh, intervals between uh, when they see the uh, client. And you may see the client every week. So that allows you to uh, monitor and, if appropriate and allowed, uh, report back to the prescriber what you think is going on. Now, of course, you're not going to be able to um, interpret lab results or even order labs or do anything of that nature, what you're monitoring is behavior and the symptoms that you observe. So if you have a client and they were particularly anxious uh, and depressed and a prescriber 
prescribe certain medications and it's very clear those symptoms have abated. Um, that's information you may want to report to the prescriber. Uh, similarly, if symptoms are worsening and uh, it seems like it's related to the medication, uh, or even if it's not, you still uh, would want to uh, inform the prescriber of what you're observing. Medication compliance is really key for medications to work. Uh, just like we want clients to comply with counseling treatment, uh, it helps them to comply with their medical treatment. So that's another area that we can monitor. Uh, so clients will often tell counselors if they are taking uh, the psychoactive drugs as prescribed and they will oftentimes tell counselors if they are taking less than, less than is prescribed, more than was prescribed, if they are mixing agents uh, with the uh, medication that could be harmful, like alcohol. So all this falls under the, the monitor function and, of course, the collaborator function as well. And uh, when that happens, when a client has uh, modified how they're taking a psychoactive drug, meaning they're no longer taking it as prescribed, you definitely uh, want to get in touch with the prescriber and let them know that. It can be very dangerous to take medications in any other manner than the manner in which they were prescribed. And of course, as a counselor, you have an obligation if there is an imminent threat. For example, if a client uh, takes an entire bottle of a particular medication, you have an obligation to act to protect them, which may involve calling uh, 911, involving emergency services. In that instance, of course, you still would want to contact the prescriber the earliest opportunity uh, in that uh, type of uh, crisis intervention situation. So the next role is the role of educator. Uh, and this is uh, a role where you can help clients understand what a medication is typically prescribed for. Uh, if you're in contact with the prescriber, uh, you could more definitively say what it was in fact prescribed for and educate them regarding the consequences of uh, taking too little of the medication, taking too much, uh, mixing, again, other agents such as alcohol with the medication, as well as help them to understand any information that came uh, with the uh, psycho psychoactive drug, like with the actual bottle, with the actual container, uh, there is an information sheet. And oftentimes, you know, because of the technical language that's used on those, uh, clients don't understand. <clears throat> they don't have training in that area. Uh, whereas uh, you would have, uh, in most cases, more training and could help educate the client about potential side effects um, and kind of what to expect from the medication. Again, you wouldn't be getting involved at any technical level in terms of the chemistry behind the uh, psychoactive drug or anything of that nature, but just general education about uh, what that drug's for and, and how it's uh, intended to be used. And then there's the role of the collaborator, which as I mentioned, kind of goes hand in hand with the role uh, of monitor. And as a collaborator, what you're doing is you're communicating with the prescriber and trying to establish a positive relationship with the prescriber. And in the context of that relationship, you can help your client. Uh, you can report uh, about your client's symptoms, uh, about the uh, compliance or non-compliance with medications. You can report the uh, symptoms. Again, many of this very similar, uh, many of these tasks very similar to what you do as monitor. And you can also uh, coordinate your treatment uh, with the medications. You know, for example, some medications, depending on when they're given, uh, might make a client very tired in the morning. So you could move their appointment to the afternoon to accommodate. So there's a lot of ways that communicating with the prescriber can help you to um, maximize the benefit that you can impart as a counselor to your client through therapy. Also, sometimes uh, the counseling 
uh, depending on your communication with the prescriber, you could focus your counseling on medication compliance and its importance and how well uh, a medication may be helping a client. Now, incidentally, this role of collaborator uh, isn't markedly different when you're collaborating with the prescriber than it would be with any uh, number of other services with other agencies that we uh, interact with. You know, for example, uh, it's not unusual for a counselor to collaborate with uh, housing services, um, career services, as well as agencies that provide uh, medical or dental services. So collaborator should be, for most counselors, a fairly familiar role. Uh, and what I would advocate is to make sure that role extends uh, to include prescribers of psychoactive drugs. And remember, as counselors, we want what is best for the client. We want the client to meet the client's goals. We want to provide the most effective treatment that we can. And oftentimes, that involves uh, positive interactions with prescribers and positive interactions with other service providers. So even as a counselor, if you have reservations about the uses of certain medications to treat uh, certain disorders, remember it has to, your actions have to be guided in large part by what is best for the client. And oftentimes uh, the use of psychoactive drugs uh, when uh, prescribed and properly monitored uh, can greatly reduce symptoms and that is a uh, very common goal that clients come forward with. They want their symptoms to be reduced or to disappear and if medications uh, help to achieve that goal then that's something as counselors that we would want to support because we want to support our clients. So one last area I want to cover, uh, and it can certainly be implied from what I've already said, is that uh, our role as uh, counselors is to support the client and to advocate for them, monitor medication compliance, educate them, and collaborate with the prescribers. It is not to provide them direct advice about uh, modifying their usage of prescribed medications. Uh, this is an extremely important point. Uh, we're not, uh, as counselors, we're not medical professionals. We're not prescribers. So it's very important that we don't wander into that territory in terms of uh, providing advice regarding the discontinuation of a medication or increasing dosage or stopping it or mixing another medication with it. Uh, that is outside of our competency and we want to uh, refer all those issues uh, back to the prescriber and communicate. Now we can certainly empathize with the client when they say that you know the side effects of a, of a medication um, you know they're not comfortable to side effects we can certainly empathize, we can certainly uh, counsel them around uh, the issue of that they're upset with having to take medication, uh, but we don't want to get involved ever in advising a client to modify their use of medication. That is a crucial point. And as a counselor, if you're effective as a collaborator with the prescriber, it should be easy to stay within those guidelines. I hope that you found uh, this video on psychopharmacology and the role of counseling uh, helpful. As always, if you have any questions or concerns, feel free to contact me and I'll be happy to assist you.